Tense relations between government and labor have been commonplace since, well, basically forever. But if a recent labor-related announcement by the province made shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder with union officials can be taken as an indication of the state of things today, perhaps a new era could be unfolding? Let's find out. Introducing our guests, as is our custom, from furthest away to closest to our studio, beginning in Mexico City, Mexico, with Jerry Dias, National President of Unifor. In Vancouver, British Columbia, Fred Hahn, President of CUPE Ontario. In Oakville, Ontario, Victoria Mancinelli, Director of Public Relations for LIUNA, the Laborers' International Union of North America. And from his office near Queen's Park in Ontario's capital city, there's Monty McNaughton. He's the Minister of Labor, Training and Skills Development and the PC member for Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. And we are grateful to all four of you for coming onto our program tonight. And I guess we should just start by saying we got to do these in the interests of full disclosure. The people taking my picture right now, the people taking your picture right now, the people making sure the sound is good, the people making sure we're all in focus, they're all Unifor people. So we get that on the record for everybody's edification. Minister, I want to start with you. In a recent speech, you said that conservative governments, quote, got it wrong for decades in their approach to the labor movement. Let's start there. What did you mean by that? Well, look, I, I've been quite clear uh, for the last couple of decades, uh, Conservatives haven't sat down uh, with Labour. I think back to my early days when Premier Ford asked me to take on as the role as Minister of Labour. Uh, I met with hundreds of Labour leaders. I was the first Minister of Labour to march uh, in the Labour Day parade. I committed to opening a new dialogue with Labour, and we've done that. You know, there's an old expression, are you the Minister of Labour or the Minister for Labour? How would you answer that question? Well, I've picked a side, and that's the side of workers, so I'm a minister for labor. All right, let's find out from your friends here uh, how they would characterize the current relationship between their union and the current government of Ontario. Jerry, come on in here, and how would you describe it? Well, it's certainly better than it would have been under Tim Hudak, and certainly better than it was under Steve Harper and may have been under Andrew Scheer. But it's like the 1980s commercial, uh, Where's the Beef?, and so there's one thing about dialogue, but there's still some legislation that this government has imposed uh, that the labor movement and working class people despise. Uh, Bill 124, which really restricts 1% uh, wage increases to public sector workers. And that includes well, workers in the healthcare field. Uh, we have workers and uh, members in long, uh, not for profit long term care facilities. Um, that are stuck at 1%. We have all the orange helicopter pilots that are stuck with 1% wage increases. So that is a real black eye to the government. We also have Bill 195, which during the pandemic ripped up collective agreements and forced workers in the healthcare sector to, you know, waive all their vacations, made it more difficult with their, you know, shift changes were implemented. And then, of course, there's Bill 47, which tore up uh, the progressive uh, labor changes that the Wynn government had put in place, which meant the elimination of equal pay for work of equal value for part-time workers. It got through away the paid sick pay. Okay, so Jerry, I, I, I'm so getting the picture here, we Jerry. We have a long way to go. I get you. I'm getting the picture, and that's a, that's a long list. On the other hand, I did see you standing beside this guy at a news conference not that long ago, praising him for $15 minimum wage. So how about that? Look, we are one balanced union. The bottom line, if somebody does something well we will support what they do. If they do something wrong, we'll talk about it. At the press conference, I said that $15 was a good start. I mean, living wage in Toronto is 22 bucks an hour. Uh, living wage in London, Ontario is 16.55 an hour. Fred, how about you? How's the relationship between your union and the government right now? Well, the way I'd answer that question is by thinking about the way the relationship with working people. Uh, Jerry mentioned Bill 124. We're talking here about hundreds of thousands of frontline workers who got our communities through the pandemic, not just in healthcare, but in social services and in our schools and many other places who are uh, restricted from making sure that their wages will ever keep pace with inflation. We don't have permanent paid sick days in the law, something that people have been calling for throughout this pandemic for almost almost two years now. And working people actually rely on services. They rely on the things that we depend upon in our communities. The most recent financial update of the government in the fall took another half a billion dollars from our public school system. So this doesn't seem to me to be progress, to be developing a good relationship with working people. Uh, all right, Victoria Mancinelli, let's get your take from Leuna's point of view. 
Sure. You know, I agree that there is definitely room for reform in our healthcare sector. But when it comes to the skilled trades portfolio, we have not seen a level of commitment to advancing skilled trades in Ontario as we have with this government. And that's a testament to the leadership of Minister McNaughton, who has enacted transformative policies to strengthen opportunities for our members and Ontario's future workforce as well as highlight the skilled trades as a viable career path in Ontario. Now, I don't have to tell you, it's not frequent that you hear somebody related to a union in this province who comes forward and sings the praises of the Minister of Labour. That almost never happens. You just did it, Victoria. How come? I mean, let's give credit where credit is due. La Una represents 100,000 members in the province, I'd say with 90% of our workforce in the skilled trades, in the construction industry. And we have a government that is listening who is enacting reform to advance labor, advance the skilled trades, highlight the vast opportunities in this industry, something that Leuna has been doing, you know, since we were founded in 1903. So to have a labor minister who is willing to work with its labor partners is fantastic. Okay. Minister, I should get you to comment on the fact that Leuna seems quite happy. Uh, Jerry Dias, when you do things he likes, is quite happy. He's not totally happy with you. Mention a few other things he's not happy with. Fred seems quite unhappy with uh, most of the approach taken. What's your reaction to what you've just heard? Well, look, my approach is that uh, business, government, and labor have to work together where we can find common ground. Let's build upon that. All of us want bigger paychecks for workers across the province. We want more uh, workplace health and safety protections for all workers. And we want to create more opportunities uh, for workers so they can provide for themselves. But most importantly, for their families and victoria is right there's such great opportunities uh, in the skilled trades many of these jobs pay six figures with a uh, defined pensions and benefits i think that's something that unites all of us let me follow up on that how difficult has it been to try to get ontarians to consider the skilled trades when it seems that for many many decades uh, mom and dad want want their kid to be a lawyer or a doctor or god forbid a journalist something like that well, look, I, I've been quite clear. I mean, for decades in this province, under different governments of different political stripes, we've uh, told every young person that the only way to be successful in life is to go to university. That's simply not the case. I think in construction over the next number of years, we're going to need 100,000 workers uh, because one in three journey persons today is over the age of 55. Uh, if we want people to get jobs with benefits uh, and pensions, then we need to promote uh, the skilled trades, and it's going to take all of us uh, to resolve this issue working together. And one more follow-up to you, Minister. I I've always thought of you, and I, I think I'm right in saying this, I've always thought of you as being on the more conservative side of the progressive conservative party. I think I well remember a time when you were kind of championing right-to-work laws as they exist in the United States uh, here in Canada. Um, you haven't always been as progressive on these issues as you seem to be right now. Is that fair to say? Well, look, we're not going down that path, uh, not now and not ever. Um, I've, you know, been a believer that actions speak louder than words. And I was on the phone uh, the very first day when I became Minister of Labour to reach out uh, to Labour leaders. Again, we've got big challenges. When you think today in Ontario, 316,000 jobs are going unfilled. We need uh, Labour at the table working with industry and government to train our workers for these uh, jobs that are going unfilled. Okay, Minister McNaughton's thinking seems to have evolved on that issue, which is fine. When the facts change, you're allowed to change your mind. Uh, Jerry Dias, I want to put the same kind of question to you because you as well have been on a bit of a journey as it relates to this premier and this government. Uh, I do remember one time you said this guy's for the rich and he's got a track record of lying and bullying. And oh my goodness, we, we did find some footage, Jerry. We did find some footage. Sheldon, you want to play that footage? You know, Doug, f you. Well, that was then. This is now. You've called the Premier a likable guy, and as I say, you stood beside him at the $15 an hour minimum wage news conference. How has your thinking evolved on this government and this Premier? Well, look. If they do something that I agree with, I say so. If they do something that I disagree with, they certainly hear it in living technicolor, as you just showed. Look, the bottom line is, is we're not in control of who gets elected. I, I agree with a thriving democracy, and that means that the parties that I want to win don't always get elected. But what it also means is that in order to benefit 
uh, working class people. I'm going to have to meet with the government and push the agenda. So I've been meeting with this government. I've been meeting with Monty. I've been meeting with the premier and I've been pushing the agenda. I would like to think the increase to 15, albeit low, was as a result of us pushing. I would like to think about some of the legislation on disconnecting and some of the other things, including skilled trades, is as a result of the labor market, uh, labor movement pushing. So, it, look, am I madly in love with all of the things that this government is doing? Of course not. Uh, did I support them in the last election? The answer is no. Uh, but ultimately, if they are going to continue to do things and move in the proper direction, then I will give praise where it's due. I would like to think that I'm fairly balanced. But like I said, uh, more times than not, they've heard um, the fear come out of Unifor. And that'll continue until they fix some of the things that I mentioned earlier on. Well, let's actually uh, fact check what you just said right now with the minister. Uh, minister, can you tell us how influential, in fact, the unions represented on this program today and others have been in your thinking to change policy in Ontario? Really influential. I I'm proud of the relationship that many of us have. I mean... Uh, again, the first three months, I met with over 100 labor leaders, uh, local local labor leaders plus provincial uh, labor leaders. Um, again, where we can find common ground, uh, let's work together and, and build upon that. Uh, and Jerry's right, we moved to $15 an hour after meeting with uh, labor leaders, and we're moving to about $15.50 an hour come October. So it is a beginning. There's lots of work we're going to continue to do uh, together. Fred, I am curious as to what went through your head when you no doubt watched that news conference of the government unveiling its move to $15 an hour for minimum wage, and you saw the head of Unifor there, the head of OPSU there, Smokey Thomas. Uh, I know there have been other news conferences where uh, Joe Mancinelli, the head of Leona, uh, was there as well. Uh, what goes through your mind when you see these labor leaders um, standing beside the premier, the finance minister, Minister McNaughton, and others? Well, while that was taking place, I was actually at the Ontario Federation of Labor Convention, where over a thousand delegates from every affiliated union uh, actually debated an emergency resolution that said we saw right through what was happening here. Let's talk about this $15 an hour minimum wage. It's like somebody stole your car three years ago and they're giving it back to you, although it's got way more kilometers on it and a few dents and scratches. You know, more than $5,000 was ripped out of the pockets of low wage workers when this government, upon being elected three years ago, reversed uh, a plan changed to the minimum wage. They, you know, they dragged workers backwards and we still aren't back to where we would have been in 2018 because well, of inflation eating away, of course, but also because there were other provisions like equal work for equal pay for temp workers, uh, you know, paid sick time permanently in the law. This doesn't even get us back to where working people were three years ago. Well, uh, but if memory serves, uh, I think you had to drive, drag the Liberals kicking and screaming to implement the $15 minimum wage increase back then. So are they in the well, same boat as the Conservatives now? What was interesting about that process is that it took two years, three years. There were uh, over 200 consultations. There were uh, a commission that traveled the province. Their recommendations were made public. They were debated publicly. Um, you know, these changes, by the way, this law also hands billions of dollars back to employers from what's called a surplus at the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board. When we have a time when workers are being denied access to, for example, mental health uh, you know, uh, claims, 94% of them today are denied at the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board. That money could be used to help the mental stress that so many workers have been through during the pandemic. Instead, it's being handed back to employers. This makes no sense. All right, Victoria, let me get you back in here. Do you believe the policies, as enunciated by this minister and others, will substantially improve the lives of your members? I do, absolutely. Again, focusing on the skilled trades, you know, we've seen this dismantling of OCOT and streamlining apprenticeship programs, getting it back to a worker-focused approach. We've seen the implementation of the Skills Development Fund that is investing in unionized and non-unionized labor training program outreach, strengthening the representation of women in the construction industry, working with our Indigenous workforce to empower career-building opportunities. So there has been tremendous, tremendous growth and investment in opportunities for our members through this government. What's your union's position on the building of the potential new Highway 413? We support it. 
And if another party were to come into power after the next election, because, you know, we have these things every few years, and they decided to cancel it, how would your union react? We'd be very disappointed. You know, this is creating hundreds and hundreds of jobs and thousands of construction hours for our members and members across the skilled trades, long-term employment that is going to spur economic development for our province. So we would be extremely disappointed if a government were to come into power and cancel the 413. Is that to say that you will campaign on behalf of the progressive conservatives in next year's election? We will for various reasons. Um, you know, we will also be supporting some NDP candidates, I'm sure. But we will not be supporting Stephen Del Duca, and I can I can say that transparently. Um, you know, in the last election, it was the Win government that orchestrated a direct attack on the members of Leuna and interfered with jurisdictional disputes. You know Stephen Del Duca's background. He's out of the union movement, right? Doesn't matter. I do. Well, I mean, that was part of it. A little bit of playing politics here with his former employer and handing over Leuna's earned jurisdiction to that former employer. Okay, back to the minister here. And, and minister, uh, you, you've made several announcements. You've been very prolific over the last several months, making many announcements on many different things. I think one of the announcements that really captured a lot of uh, public imagination and discussion was the one where, and I forget, the, it's like the disconnecting from work bill is basically what it is, where, you know, if emails come in at 8 o'clock at night, there shouldn't be an expectation from your employer that you have to get to that immediately, that it ought to be able to wait until the next day. People think that's what's in the bill, in fact, I think all you've got on offer here is that you've told companies they need to have a policy around this, not that they cannot expect a return email at 8 or 9 o'clock at night. Question, are you actually getting credit for something you're not really doing? Uh, well, well, I think so. I mean, look, the pandemic has changed the world of work uh, for everyone, and the lines between you know personal time and family time is blurred with... Uh, work time. So we want employers uh, with 25 or more employees to have um, a right to disconnect policy to be very transparent with workers uh, when they should and must um, respond to emails and phone calls and when they should be uh, completely off the clock. So you're right, we introduced uh, the Working for Workers Act, which you know goes far beyond the right to disconnect policy. We're cracking down on uh, those bad actors that run temporary help agencies uh, we're ensuring that uh, truck drivers have uh, washroom access, uh, and we're recognizing uh, foreign credentials for newcomers that come to Ontario. Jerry Dias, what's your view of that bill? Well, you've you got to put some meat on the bones. I mean, ultimately, you're leaving it up to the employers uh, to come up with a policy that's kind of like Colonel Sanders taking care of the chickens. But in the last five years, Canada has gone from about 4% of the workforce working remotely to 32% today. So there has to be some changes. There's a lot of people who are, you know, working from home for free. Uh, what are we going to do as it relates to overtime? Um, I, I would argue that the working remotely and working from home um, is impacting women much more. Uh, women still carry their family responsibilities, I will argue, more than men. Uh, therefore, when you balance work and in, in, in family, it really starts to blur the lines. Uh, we used to talk about uh, uh, working from home. Now it's actually living from work. So we need to have some solid, solid legislation as it relates to the gig economy. But what are the rules? So it's a good debate. It's a good discussion, and we need to have it. But there has to be some legislation that actually starts to say, here's what it means. Um, uh, people are going to stop uh, responding to emails after 7 p.m. at night. Um, if they're responding after that, what's the compensation? Uh, what's the time off the job to compensate for that? What are there's a heck of a lot of questions. Like I said, there's a lot of European companies, uh, countries that are implementing it. Italy, France, so I can start to walk through it. Uh, but there's a lot of work to do in this subject, but it's necessary because of the changing economy. Minister, how do you take that criticism? Well, no, uh, Jerry's right. I mean, look, this is a, a starting point. This is going to be in the Employment Standards Act that companies have to have uh, a right to disconnect policy. It also puts workers in the driver's seat when they go for a job interview for example they can ask what is the right to disconnect policy of the company so jerry's right the world of work is changing government has to keep up and we're going to continue to bring forward uh, reforms that put workers in the driver's seat and, and respond to uh, the changing workplace uh, I, I think the automobile metaphors are uh, blooming today uh, fred hahn started it now minister mcnaughton continues it uh, Fred, tell me whether you believe that the current bill puts workers in the driver's seat, as the minister suggests it does. 
It does not. In the right to disconnect, it's a policy in the workplace. We already have the Employment Standards Act. There's no enforcement. There are no fine for employers. There's not even a recommendation on what this policy should look like. When it comes to using the washroom, something that I think, you know, that's just human decency. The bill actually says that employers don't have to do that. They can deny it if it's reasonable to them or if it's if, it, if it's not you know practical for them to allow access. That's a pretty big hole you can drive through. And the worst part of this legislation that isn't really getting talked about a lot is Schedule 6 that hands billions of dollars back to employers at a time when 24,000 healthcare workers have fallen sick due to COVID-19 in the last two years, and very few cases have been recognized by the board. When again, 94% of all cases for mental health and stress, something we all recognize has been the case for workers during this pandemic are denied at the board. And yet they're taking money, which they call a surplus and handing it back to employers. That's the sixth time in six years that premiums for employers are being cut. There's nothing here working for workers. Okay, let me follow up on that, Fred, because we did have OPSU President Smokey Thomas on this program uh, just a few weeks back, and his quote was, no matter what any party does, especially the Conservatives, it will never be enough for some members of the labor movement. It will always be too late. They'll find something to criticize. Are you playing into his hands by taking the approach you have on this program tonight? Well, what I think is really important is to think about how this Im impacts working people. Will it actually help workers to disconnect from work? There's no teeth in this policy. It won't actually help. Will it actually provide bathroom access to delivery drivers? Not with that giant hole that's in the legislation. And will it hurt working people when money that could be used to help people who've been injured or fallen sick during a global health pandemic, the likes of which we've never seen, that that money could be used to help workers. Instead, it's going back to employers. I don't think that anyone when they know those details, would say it's, uh, you know, helping working people. Okay, let's find out from uh, Victoria how it works at Leona. Do you, um, well, let's do a real life example. Email comes in at nine o'clock at night. What do you do, Victoria? Well, I work in public relations, so disconnecting for me is a little bit more difficult. Um, as well as our members in the construction industry. But, you know, there is a lot more to this bill, including, you know, working with the federal government on immigration reform. The province is facing a labor shortage. It has been for years now, and the COVID-19 pandemic has amplified the need to start recruiting more workers, especially in areas like the skilled trades. So this one aspect of this bill on working on, you know, upskilling and attracting talent to Ontario is something that is going to greatly affect our industry. Would you uh, be disappointed, Victoria, if the NDP were to form the next government of Ontario? Listen, Layuna works with all levels of government across our part, all party lines. However, there is a lot that Layuna does not see eye to eye on with the NDP. And I think a lot of it stems from this strong focus on these traditional ideologies of what a conservative government is and is supposed to be. And that automatically puts up this great barrier not to welcome any positive reform that is impacting our workers. And another aspect with the NDP that you know we continuously bump heads on is investing in infrastructure projects, especially when it comes to the P3 model. It is something that we have tried to educate them on and try you know, to bring necessary reform, and it's just not gaining any movement. You're talking about the public-private partnerships, which which the NDP would prefer the government just ran the show on, as opposed to find some partner in the private sector to do. They say ultimately it's cheaper. You're not buying it. I'm not buying it. You know, Layuna has invested in built eight hospitals in the province of Ontario using this model. Hospitals and healthcare institutions that most likely would not have been built without the P3 model, while creating job opportunities for our members and spurring economic activity and creating much needed infrastructure that our communities rely on. Okay. Minister, I do want to get back to you to talk about uh, the, conserv the Progressive Conservative Party's relationship with Labour. And, uh, you know, for those of, of a certain age, they well remember the Mike Harris years in the province of Ontario where there were numerous strikes. There, were, uh, there was a lot of strife with Labour. And the PC party, as then defined, uh, thought of it as part of a badge of honour to get as tough on Labour as possible under the circumstances. 
Uh, Tim Hudak obviously never won an election, but he seemed to, as a minister in that government, take the same approach uh, when he was the leader of the PC party. Uh, Doug Ford, actually, was the same way in his first year, and he has uh, clearly changed his tune uh, as we get closer to an election. I don't know if those two things have anything in common. I guess my question for you is, how tough a sell was it to the labor movement when you approached them and basically said, I'm going to try to do things differently? Yeah, look, it, it takes time to build relationships. I've spent uh, a lot of time, uh, you know, at coffee shops, uh, meeting with labor leaders in my office, hitting the road in every corner of the province uh, to sit down. Uh, it really is about personal diplomacy, uh, building trust, and finding that common ground. And I just believe, you know, passionately that uh, all of us want bigger paychecks for people that build stronger families. Um, we want uh, more health and safety protocols and, and more opportunities. We want more people getting their fair share of the economic pie. That's what I think unites all of us. When you told the premier and presumably his chief of staff and other senior ministers, this was the new approach you wanted to take as the minister for labor, as you just described yourself, uh, what was their initial reaction? Full buy-in. I mean, I, I knew- Well, not from the beginning. Ford. It wasn't full buy-in from the beginning. Well, look, when I became Minister of Labor, um, Premier Ford and I, uh, you know, worked together. We wanted to find a common ground. But even going back further, I mean, I knew his brother Rob and, of course, the Premier himself. Uh, I mean, they are on the side of the little guy. They return phone calls. They show up at people's front doors to help them. Uh, it's in their DNA, and it's in our DNA as Conservatives to help uh, working families. I think you can remind me of this if my memory's off, but when you ran for leader of the Ontario PC party, who did Rob Ford support? He did support me uh, when I ran, and uh, he and I go back uh, a long ways and think the world of him. Okay, Jerry, let me get you back in here. Do you think your membership will seriously consider voting progressive conservative in the next Ontario election based on the positive things that you see this government having done for working people? Well, we've always had members that have voted for all three mainline parties. Um, and our union has been brutal uh, with successive conservative parties. Um, but I would be naive to think that our members, by and large, 100 uh, percent, voted the way they were asked to by, by their respective labor leaders. Look, Unifor has had a policy in the CAW before that. We don't have any blind loyalty to any party. That's because I will argue there's no party that has any blind loyalty to the labor movement. If I think about the NDP in BC, my good friend John Horgan, I'm still waiting for him to implement card check at 55%. If I think about 15 years of NDP rule in Manitoba, the best we ever got was card check at 65%. I can walk right through Alberta as well at card check at 60%. So. Uh, look, I remember just a couple of elections ago where we had a hard time getting Andrea Horvath to talk about increasing minimum wage because she was courting small businesses. So I've got a whole list of, of problems that I've had with the Liberal governments. Same thing, of course, with Conservative governments. But ultimately, uh, we will talk about issues that are important to working people, what makes a difference in our lives, which makes a difference in our workplaces. And our members are going to vote how they see fit. For me to presuppose how they will vote, would be simplistic and naive at me at best. I understand that, but will you endorse any one of the parties in the lead up to the next election? It would be a shame, it would, excuse me, it would be a change if we did. Uh, we have never came out and said, we're putting all of our support behind one party. Normally we've been ABC, anything but conservative. Uh, at the end of the day, we will sit down with our board and we'll decide our politics and our response to the next provincial election at the appropriate time. So you're open to it potentially if the board goes along? Well, it would be a quantum leap, let me put it that way, for the board to say that we're going to be su supporting the Conservative Party of Ontario, especially with 124 hanging out there. Our health care workers are mad. Our orange helicopter uh, members are mad. Um, Bill 195 infuriates a lot of people because of tearing up in the collective agreements. I can walk through a lot of laws that were passed, Bill 7, that have infuriated people. Are they doing things differently today than they were three years ago? Absolutely. But the proof is in the pudding. We watched Aaron O'Toole get elected as a blue Tory. The first thing Aaron O'Toole said when he was running was he was going to be Jerry Dice's worst nightmare. And then he ran an election pretending to be a red Tory, which nobody bought. So the proof is in the pudding and time is, is what is required. Talk is cheap. Actions mean a lot. 
Well, Fred's pudding's always been orange. Fred has always said, I'm a proud New Democrat. Yeah. And uh, Fred, do you plan to have your union endorse the New Democrats in the lead up to the next election? Uh, I, uh, our, our members debate policy. They know what they feel strongly and passionately about. And then we talk about which political party actually reflects that. Uh, and so the closest to what our members would like to see for themselves and their children and their communities and their future is what the NDP has had on offer. But I want to just go back for one quick second to this notion of helping the little guy. Because what we saw during the pandemic was that small businesses were left to wither while big box stores were allowed to open and yeah. have massive profits. What we saw that one of the first acts that the government took on when it was first elected was to reverse labor law, to actually uh, stop a minimum wage increase, to actually prevent equal pay for equal work for temporary workers. This isn't helping the little guy. It's important. And I think our members and other working people and their neighbors and their friends have to start to sift our way through the spin and what's being presented. And look at what's really happening, what's really on offer. The truth of the matter is we're further behind than we were when this government was first elected. We are still in a pandemic where they're refusing to invest and do the things that are necessary to keep people safe. And they're presenting legislation saying it's actually working for workers that gives billions of dollars back to employers that could be helping people who are injured as a result of being at work. Okay, These forgive me, Fred. I've got to jump in because we're down to our... I hear you. Th those are the facts, as you've enunciated them. We're down to our last 30 seconds. I want to give it to the minister because in spite of what Fred says, I've actually heard from plenty of businesses who think your, po your positions have been too labor friendly and, and too anti-business. And I wonder how you deal with that. Well, look, um, as I said, I pick the side. It's the side of workers. Um, we have to build back a better and stronger province uh, for workers and their families. Uh, we've you know, been there for small businesses throughout the pandemic to the tune of billions of dollars. We now have to ensure that workers are getting a fair share of the economic pie. Uh, this is the beginning, the Workers for Workers Act and the changes that we're bringing forward, like recognizing foreign credentials, uh, banning non-compete clauses and the other things we've talked about. Uh, but there's going to be more to come. I want to thank Fred Hahn from QP Ontario, Jerry Dias from Unifor, Victoria Mancinelli from Layuna. And um, I don't I, I hope, anyway, the rest of you won't mind if I say I'm grateful to Monty McNaughton for coming on the program, uh, along with stakeholders. It is a rare day in the province of Ontario when any minister shows up on a program with people who are going to criticize him. So, Minister McNaughton, thanks for coming on and good for you for doing so. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.